Thank you, Adam. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk, Demystifying the Dependency Injection with ZO2. So today I'm going to talk about what is dependency injection, what solutions we have in Scala to solve the problem of dependency injection, and what is the idiomatic ZO2 way. So we'll take a look at Z layers, we'll talk about best practices and what to avoid. So really, when we talk about dependency injection, we are trying to solve two different problems. One problem is how do we propagate our dependencies through our application, and the other is how do we wire up our application graph at the, at the edge of our program. So in this example, we have a, like a cashier API that processes a loyalty card at the cash register. Uh, we are finding some coupons and then we're send, sending these discounts uh, via email. So this API uh, creates its own dependencies, so it creates its instances, and this is hard to test. And there's a tight coupling between this service and its dependencies. So what we can do is that we just push all these dependencies to the constructor, and we can keep this uh, pattern through the whole code base, but somewhere at the edge of our application, we need to wire up this dependency graph. So it looks quite simple in this Silly, simple example, but, and some people are even asking, like, why do we need a library for this? Why can't we just do it manually? And so there are some things that would be nice to have and that they are quite complex to do it uh, without any frameworks. So let's say we want to parallelize creation of services or we want to we retry construction if it fails or what about we want to have some finalization. So let's take a look at some solutions in Scala and see how they compare against each other. So first of all, I wanted to talk about a reader monad. So reader monad is a data type that uh, in order to be run, you need to run it with some instance of, of an environment. So basically what you need to do is you need to create some wrapper of all of your, of all of your dependencies. But obviously, uh, like different methods of uh, your application, they depend on a, on a different uh, part of your environment. So you can, uh, you can map the environment with this uh, local method, and then you just specify a specific uh, dependency that each of your services is using. Now at this point you might be wondering why it's so complicated, why reader monad cannot infer uh, all these dependencies, and in fact it can, but it will do exactly what Zio is doing. It will infer dependencies uh, as an intersection type uh, to the environment. But the problem with this is that you need to run your reader with the instance of this intersection type. And if all of your dependencies are just traits, then you can maybe create the instance of uh, this intersection type. But otherwise, if any of your dependency is, is a class, then you, you cannot really satisfy this instance because you cannot extend more than uh, one class. And so the real difference between reader monad and Zio is that uh, in Zio the environment type is actually just a phantom type. So phantom type is a type for which there uh, exists no value and Zio is just using this phantom type to verify the layers that you specified if they satisfy the environment. and. Uh, and with reader, uh, this is now how, how you actually uh, do the dependency injection with reader monad. I just show it to uh, show the difference. Uh, so really what we're missing is the power of the provide method that we have in Zio. So the new thing in Scala 3 are the so-called context functions. And we can model dependencies using the context functions. Uh, they have similar drawbacks as, uh, as re reader monad, but one important drawback is that there is no type inference. Like you, we need to specify this return type, uh, like all these contexts and, uh, that our application depends on. And the reason is that uh, in compiler is already inferring, is doing the term inference. So it, it infers value based on the type, so it cannot do the type inference. So that's, uh, that's, that's the biggest drawback. So let's take a look at some uh, frameworks. So for example, Juice, uh, it uh, has almost minimal boilerplate. It uses this inject annotation. 
uh, you, can, you can annotate your constructors and it just works. But because it's based on runtime reflection and runtime processes, processing of annotations, uh, it can add uh, some performance uh, hit to your application. Also, everything will fail at runtime if you, if you did it incorrectly. So this is probably not what we want. MacWire is uh, another framework that, uh, on the other hand, is based on macros. Uh, it's, uh, I would say, a very minimalistic framework. And uh, if you do something wrong, then you get the error messages at compile time. Uh, there are not really any drawbacks. I would just say that uh, it's less powerful than Z layers. Uh, Z layers introduces this idea of turning a constructor into a value. So I'll talk about that in a second. And I create this uh, nice table that just shows the pros and cons of each approach. So really, the reader mode and context functions, they don't solve the problem of wiring up dependency graph. So that's why there are lots of rats there. Juice is uh, not type safe framework. And uh, MacWire just uh, has less power than Z-Layer. Like, it, uh, it, you can have fin finalization in MacWire. Uh, but it only works with uh, instances of CATS resource and not, not with Z-Layer scopes. So yeah, according to the table we just saw, it looks like Z-Layers are absolutely the best, right? And so still, like I, I had a call with one of my colleagues and he told me that uh, he loves ZO but he hates Z-Layers. And I was wondering, why, why is that? And then I took a look at the code base and I saw this uh, service pattern 1.0. So uh, this uh, is just weird. It has, has, has. Uh, it's, thank God, it's only in 0, 0 0.1. But really, uh, this pattern tries to, uh, <coughs> it tries to uh, hide has as an implementation detail. But really, has is not an implementation detail because you need to know when you are working with hashes, when you're working uh, with the uh, with the services. And also there is this process loyalty card uh, accessor method, with, which brings me to the next point. And uh, this might sound a bit uh, controversial, but I'm not really a fan of accessor methods. Uh, mostly I think they hurt code navigation, like you go to accessor method, then you go to trade, then you go to implementation. Uh, so my colleagues were always complaining about it. And also, really, you should do dependency injection uh, via constructor parameters. So accessor methods are only useful like at the edge of your program. And I would say it's easier just to, or maybe more explicit, to just get the service instance from like the, let's say, dependency injection container, and then invoke uh, methods there explicitly. And also, they might be a bit confusing uh, because they may lead to environment overuse or, or misuse, which brings me to the next point, which is misuse of environment for uh, dependency injection. So uh, yeah, uh, the dependencies are exposed to the color of the method. And also I think uh, this kind of hurts the discoverability. Like for instance, where here is used logger. We, we don't really know. We need to go through each line of code to find out which introduces the logger dependency. And this is a simple example. In a complex application with a, with a lot of lines of code, this, this, can, be, uh, this can make a mess. And also, manual wiring of dependencies, like we've all been there. It's uh, just painful. All right, so what should we do? Uh, so first of all, we should use constructor for uh, dependency injection of, of our global services. So no magic here. We have just a trait. We have a case class implementation. And the, the reason why it's a case class is that then it's uh, quite simple to just create uh, a layer, uh, or, well, Z layer in the companion object. Like in the, in, for instance, we, cr we can create Z layer with Z layer from function uh, and case class that apply. And I also added another more complicated example from Zio SQL. That's, well, that's how we create the uh, Docker containers and uh, we add this to, to our uh, tests, and then after the tests are finished running, the Docker container is stopped. So, yeah, Eagle already talked about uh, when to use environments. 
this is another example, to use it uh, for local eliminable efforts. Like uh, in this case, uh, we want to call get user profile, uh, but only in case the incoming request passes authentication. So um, we are providing this, this layer, and if, if we fail to create the layer, then the request will fail with uh, invalid session error. And then at the end of your program, uh, it's some boilerplate, but I would say that it's uh, uh, not so much. So uh, we provide la comma-separated layers to our program, and this, this gives us a lot of benefits, like, for instance, compile time errors and, and warnings. So warnings by redundant dependencies, so this helps to clip our, keep our code base uh, nice and clean. Yeah, let's sum up. So uh, rules of thumb, uh, use constructor for global services, use, an, use environment for local eliminable services, use layers to describe constructors, let zero out of our and avoid old patterns, uh, misusing of environment for dependency injection, and also accessor methods, in my opinion, they do more harm than good. So thank you very much. Uh, in case you're wondering, then my colleague loves Zillers now. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just 10 minute talk. So uh, in case you didn't catch any code, make sure to go to my GitHub and check it out. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>